Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. So we finally made it past the heat wave, thank God. We were actually at 110 to 12 here in Southern California. So I'm happy to be back down in the, wait for it, in the low 90s. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't feel like we're quite at fall yet, even though we're almost there. Uh, but I am so ready for a little bit of cooler weather. Anyway, I hope everyone is having a good September so far. What I'd like to talk about today is something that, oh my gosh, it comes up actually quite a bit, especially with my Coding Corner clients. And those, you know, I have that service where if you have coding, billing, compliance, uh, any kind of questions like that, we do our best to answer them for you by doing the legwork for you. So we will do the research, we'll find the cited references, we even help you with um, appeals, things like that. So you can always go to our website at terryfletcher.net and join either our executive membership or our regular membership. And so here is one of the questions that, or here are a couple questions actually that come up quite a bit. And I feel like I need to title it and that sometimes the rules are as clear as mud. <laughs> and what that really means is that there are times when I'll get a question and there really isn't any kind of specific published guidance or Medicare policy or anything that I can say you have to do it this way. So then what we do is we look at the language of Medicare. A lot of us know that's kind of called Medicare speak. And then we have to make what we call a best practices or a, a compliance policy within your office to make sure that everyone's following it. Otherwise, if you're ever questioned on it, I've noticed that Medicare, some of the uh, commercial plans, even DOJ and OIG, they come back and they say, well, the spirit of the rule, or you should have known better. And so we have to look at some of these things that are, and I don't like this word, but are ambiguous or just really don't have what you're not supposed to do. You know, it's really hard to defend a negative, but you're, you're trying to always find, well, why can't I do that? Give me a source. So we're going to we're going to really talk about this as clear as mud. And I'm going to give you some insights on a couple of situations that come up every once in a while. So here's one that comes up all the time. And I also saw something recently on Coding Intel, which is Betsy Nicoletti's website, that also addressed the issue. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of physicians and a lot of, I mean, hundreds over my 35, 36 years in uh, the field. And I've noticed that a lot of physicians can be chronically behind in dictating their notes, okay? And charts are just not up to date, but they still want their charges reported or billed and that's a problem especially when the patient's coming back in for a return visit and nothing's been documented or let's say they're looking for their lab results you know t seven to ten days later in their patient portal and or even just call the office and say have you heard yet and nothing's been there or a, let's say a payer asks for or requests additional information and the ADRs, additional information, additional information requests, documentation requests, and you can't find an op report. And so here is the problem typically that happens. You know, we've got a provider that has a bunch of task bars open on their, on their um, computer. So they've got messages, open notes, reports to review. They've got to renew some scripts. They, they need to dictate some records. And then all of a sudden they're like, wait, I gotta go see a patient. And now they leave their desk and now they've got all these incomplete charts because somebody has either logged them out or they haven't finished. And now you've got some aged issues and aged claims there and, un and unbilled claims or because you don't have charts finished. And a lot of the EMRs now have a, you know, a problem because they, unless you close out the note, meaning it's, it's finished, you can't submit it for uh, billing, which is appropriate. And so the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, when you talk about how soon after a service is performed on a Part B fee-for-service basis, how soon do those services have to be documented? Well, here's a quote from the Part B um, Claims Processing Manual, and it says, the service should be documented during or as soon as practicable after it's provided in order to maintain an accurate medical record. Well, that doesn't say one day, two days, three days, 30 days. It just says practical. Well, what is that? 
So I think we can all agree that, you know, weeks or months later is not as soon as practical, okay? Um, a lot of physician groups are saying that it should be that that day, I mean, you're in the room with the patient, or at the very longest, the um, 24 hours. And a lot of hospitals even mandate that it should be done within three days. Um, I would consider a policy that the note has to be closed within three days. And otherwise, I wouldn't give the physician credit for it. Now, there's no specific regulation that says that, you know, it has to be those times. But think about this. Somebody said, well, since Medicare doesn't say specifically and give days, hours, weeks, months, whatever, that it has to be documented, then why are you saying that, you know, I'm non-compliant? Well, let's say that you submitted a note or you, I'm sorry, you submitted a claim for an office visit and it was not documented or it wasn't finished and it was submitted and now somebody's asking for that information. Well, you submitted a claim that didn't have complete documentation and that is a problem. You have to make sure that if you're going to submit a claim, you have to be able to support it. And if it's not completed, then it's not supported. And so even though the claims processing manual for Medicare, chapter 12, 30.6.1 says that as soon as practicable, you should have an internal policy to look at both compliance concerns and revenue concerns. So, you know, you, you have to have somebody that's, that's managing this problem if you have physicians that are just terrible when it comes to documentation. Because submitting a claim for a medical record service or for anything that you do that's not documented could be considered a false claim act because you know the old saying, they say not documented, not done. Well, I don't like to say that. I say not documented, not supported. And that seems to be a little bit more accurate. So even though we don't have a specific saying the timeline, we do have specific saying what is practicable. And it's unfortunately, it's subjective. So it depends what auditor, what reviewer, what person handling a TPE or you pick audit. And for me, if I don't see it within 72 hours, if I'm the one auditing your record, I would say, where, how are you going to remember? Where, you know, where's the issue here? What, what's your workflow? What's the problem? And so, um, and that would be the maximum. I'd like to see it done while the patient's there or within 24 hours, but a mandate that says without it being within 72 hours, then the doctor actually loses the charge. Now, this next one that, again, another one of those that's as clear as mud, a question comes up all the time that says, what's the level of risk that's associated or assigned in your E&M service when the practitioner refers a patient to a physician in another specialty? Does the complexity of the problem, such as cancer, make a difference? So when you read the AMA guidelines, when you read the CPT guidelines on E&M, referral to a specialist is considered minimal or low risk. The risk of the problem is distinct from the risk of the management. And you'll see that in any E&M tool, and it's in the CPT um, 2024, page 8. And what it says is, and I'm quoting from that page, it, cause, because they added a statement clarifying the risk and the definition of problems addressed versus the risk of additional diagnostic testing, treatment, or referrals. It says the term risk, and I'm air quoting, as used in the definition of this element relates to the risk from the condition. Okay, so while risk, while the condition risk and management risk may often correlate, the risk from the condition is distinct from the risk of the management. So the condition of the patient and problems addressed, that's one area. But then what you're going to do about that in the risk of the management, and that's considered to related to the condition itself um, from, or I'm sorry, that's considered risk of the additional diagnostic testing or treatment. So the management at the encounter, the risk of the patient management criteria to the patient management decisions made by the reporting physician or other healthcare professional as part of the reported encounter. That applies to the decision made by the clinicians who is reporting the service. It doesn't apply to the decisions that another practitioner will make. So if you have a patient that has a suspected, let's say, melanoma, and you send them to a dermatologist, your risk is going to be low because you don't know what they're going to do with it, but you want another doctor to check it out. You're not basing it on the risk of the, the cancer, the melanoma itself, because, again, it's something that 
that other physician has to determine. Now, when that other doctor gets it, and let's say it is, and they have to do either a major surgery or even a minor surgery with risk factors, and maybe clear the margins, and it turns out it is cancer, that's on that physician. So you, you can't take you can't take the severity of the condition for the risk of element at the time of the referral. You have to only take credit for what you're actually doing. And you're, so you, the risk of the treating uh, mono, melanoma would be counted at the visit by the physician who'll treat the condition. What you'll actually get is the referral to, to send the patient out. And so, and that's additional testing. You're gonna send them out. So you're probably looking at more of low and they may be looking at moderate or even a step up could be moderate to high. So just be aware, I know that's as clear as mud, but it's just, you, you have to really understand that, again, that the referral to a specialist risk, minimal or low, is different than the actual physician handling the problem because that's their management. It's not your management. Okay, and so that's kind of getting beyond that understanding of that question. And then my last clear as mud um, question versus how do we do it is something that I'm sure all of you at one point or another have dealt with. And it's, it's actually kind of an unfortunate question because I know physicians can be frustrated with it. I know coders are frustrated with this question because the answer is not necessarily compliant. And the question is, what can I use to code when a patient presents to established care with our practice but doesn't have any symptoms or problems? So where do you usually see this? Well, primary care is one. You also may see this in a pediatrician's office. Let's say that a mom is looking to see if they like the pediatrician, but she's still pregnant and there's no patient. So then, what, what happens? Well, I know when I had my daughter all those years ago, almost 30 now, it, her pediatrician, basically they didn't do that. And they were like, you should know me based on my reputation. And so I was like, oh boy. And I did a lot of reading. And then back then, I don't even remember what kind of internet we had. I'm aging myself. Not, not a lot of information. So, you know, you're pulling information out of, um, gosh, I'm going to age myself a lot here, out of phone books, out of... Um, you know, advisories, you're looking at patient satisfactory, you're calling your insurance plan saying, what is this doctor like? And you're asking anybody, hey, has anybody ever used this doctor? Now we have a lot more options with the internet to figure out what's going on. But also remember, there's a lot of false information from, you know, somebody that maybe just didn't like that one visit. Um, I see on Yelp all the time where there's a complaint that they give them one star from a five-star restaurant because they wouldn't serve them alcohol after having 10 drinks. I'm like, well, that's a, that's a restaurant I want to go to. And so those are tough. But back to the question, what do you code when a patient comes in that doesn't have any symptoms? Well, this is tough because it's not a great position for the patient to be in. First of all, you're trying to establish care without having any kind of medical issue. And what do we have to do first? We have to have medical necessity for the service. So we call these meet and greets. And I know a lot of providers say, well, I'll just bill a level two visit. Well, remember, we have to have number and complexity of problems addressed. And even a level two says self-limited or minor problem. Well, establishing care isn't a problem. And then somebody says, well, maybe we should go to the preventative medicine services, the 99381 to 397. Well, this can be difficult as well because typically only one preventative service is paid um, for, for children after age two and adults per year. And the practice may not know if or when the patient had this preventative service within the past year with their primary care physician or their regular doctor. And the visit actually also may not be scheduled with enough time because remember these also have a comprehensive history, risk factor reduction and exam but built into those services. And typically a meet and greet is just to have a chat and get to know the physician and figure out, you know, or maybe establish care with, I've got these three things, I've already, I'm already up to date on my prescriptions, I just moved here from another I was going to say another planet. You can tell where I'm at today <laughs> from another state. Oh my gosh. And yeah, I just moved here from another planet. And so another state, and you're just basically just trying to fill out if you like this provider, you know, because they're close to home or whatever. 
So here's what I recommend. Unless there is, again, a problem or there's something that needs to be addressed, it's not an ENM service. You can't put a 52 modifier on a preventative service. But there is a code 99499, which is an unlisted ENM, that is a cash service. So it's something that you can actually put in your system for tracking. It's, you charge whatever you like. Obviously, I wouldn't go too high, maybe 100 bucks, and say that we do have a cash a uh, patient charge to uh, meet the physician, you know, to establish care. And that's what I recommend because remember, you're also dealing with the diagnosis. And that's your, one of the problems with trying to bill for this with an office visit. You have your Z00.00 or Z71.89. And these are, you know, persons encountering health services for counseling or their medical advice or well check. And we know that our commercial payers don't even like that code. Medicare definitely doesn't like the preventative service codes, they allow amounts of what you can charge the patient, but they only pay for, you know, annual well visits, their own G codes. They have, they have their own set of codes for preventative situations. So I probably didn't make that too much clearer for you, but I did give you a best practice option as far as having something that is an internal code. It's kind of like sports medicine physicals, which again, I guess that would be an extension of this where the patient's coming in just to get cleared to play soccer at school or they're getting cleared um, to, to be, you know, um, put on a team uh, for middle school or something like that. There's a lot of community outreach programs that do that and they charge $35 or $50 to come in and, and cough, bend over, look at them, just, you know, do a quick history and say, you know what, you're good to go. And so, you know, sometimes they may find something in that visit, sometimes they don't, but they basically see if the patient, or I'm sorry, if the person that comes in can tolerate, you know, excessive heat or tolerate the exercise, something like that. And so um, those kinds of things are tough because we don't have definitive codes, definitive answers. We don't even have definitive payer policies. So when that happens, I really strongly urge you to make sure that you have a best practice um, policy in your office, compliance plan, so that in case you have it questioned, that you're not inviting risk, that you can respond to that question, that this is what we do and this is what we do for everyone. So, you know, I would, lo I would look to that and that seems to be the, the best way to handle the situation. But you need to have a policy and don't just leave it to, hey, what do we do now? So, so try something like that. So my personal tidbit for this week is I'm actually heading to Las Vegas for a couple of days with my husband and actually my daughter and her husband are going to um, drive out as well. It's about three hour drive from my house, about four and a half from theirs in Phoenix. And this is the first time I've ever been to Vegas with my daughter where we're actually going to sit at a, a table and, and do a little gambling. Yes, I'm spotting her a couple hundred dollars because I don't want her to throw her money down a toilet. But <laughs> before we've only been there for softball when she was in high school and in tournaments and in travel ball. So this will be a little bit different. And I said, hey, once this is gone, you go down to the pool and <laughs> you just hang out down there. This is not, you do not bring your ATM card. So we'll let, we'll figure out how that goes. But just excited to get away for a couple days, have a nice birthday dinner and just do something that doesn't require work. So those of you that get to do something that I like pie gal poker. So I will just sit there for a couple hours and just play pie gal poker. It doesn't, it's very low risk. Look it up if you don't know what it is, P-A-I-G-O-W poker. And I've been playing for, I don't know, 25 years and it's very fun. I usually win kind of a good amount of money, but we'll see what happens. So everyone have a good rest of your day. Make it a great week. And thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing, and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music.